um, Andrew and Alec coming forward. Councillors, this is another good news story. We had a launch of the Green Bonds last year. It was a great success. Indeed, it was oversubscribed, and it's uh, subsequently has really helped um, launch one tremendous amount of interest in the uh, Green Bond market in New Zealand. And I think the headlines always appear to be the new gold bond is the Green Bond. So, um, please. Uh, kia ora koutou, uh, tēnā koe chair, tēnā koe uh, mea goth. Um, ko Alec Tang tōku ingoa, uh, e mahi ane mō te taritikanga tō kanga rua mātua. Um, so I'm Alec Tang, I sit in the Chief Sustainability Office at Auckland Council, for those of you who don't know. Um, I don't have a slide presentation. Um, uh, the chair has stolen my line, my opening line. This is another good news story. Um, I just want to point you to two parts of the report. Um, the first is, I guess, clauses uh, 14 through to 16, where... Um, we just highlight some of those broad benefits. Of course, the green bond issuance that we did last year was great from a financial perspective, and I have uh, Andrew John from our Treasury office here um, that, that can answer any of those financial questions. But there was also a bunch of broader benefits for council um, and for the city, actually, in terms of um, profile raising and the, on the ensuing activities that that has spurred for New Zealand's sustainable finance sector. Um, the second bit that I just wanted to flag I guess is clause 18. So um, the purpose of this paper was one, to just, just flag some of that um, good news because I don't think we actually came back to you post issuance. Um, and then the second bit is to talk about this green bond pledge. So as part of developing this first, this inaugural issue for, for New Zealand, um, we were obviously engaging with CBI, the Climate Bonds Initiative, and one of their schemes that they're, they're trying to put together to, to further increase the um, the, 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 the number of green bonds and the value of green bonds being issued was this green bond pledge. And, and really, um, Clause 18 sets out the four components of that pledge. Um, really, first, so Part A is, is a statement to say that all infrastructure and capital projects should be climate resilient and where relevant support the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, the second part is acknowledging the role that green bonds play. Um, for those of you who um, weren't here, um, the green bonds specifically fund and finance assets with a green or climate outcome, so really drives that, that objective. Um, there is a commitment from signatories to support that rapid growth of the green bonds market by committing to issue whenever applicable and appropriate bonds for infrastructure as green bonds, and it's important that applicable and appropriate recognition there that not everything is appropriate and not everything is applicable but where we see those, um, those elements that we will issue a green bond. And then the final one is really a commitment to establish a green bond strategy, which in effect is our green bond framework, which we already have in place. Um, so that's all I have to say. Um, could you just uh, confirm, because it was early days, but was there a margin that we actually managed to save over what would be um, the normal bond issue at the time? And also just to confirm, uh, the compliance cost, the annual compliance cost for, for uh, verifying back to the appropriate authorities that we're actually spending the money, e.g. on the electric trains. So. Um, I'll answer the second question first. Uh, with regards to compliance cost, uh, uh, the process requires uh, verification and certification. So we got EY to verify that climate bond certified it. The cost uh, for the initial issue was around $50,000. Uh, but that includes because you need pre-issuance verification and then you need post-issuance verification as well. So we, uh, that will be done later um, uh, in the next few months, but the total cost is around 50000 Ongoing issuance, potentially we don't need um, a post-issuance verification once we have a pool of assets that we can fund through. With regards to the cost um, of issuance, um, just a few caveats around it is that um, we track our bonds that trade on the secondary market. Uh, when we issued our bond last year in June, we had not issued a bond domestically for some time, and our bonds were trading at um, uh, what we call, what, when we look at it, it was like 50 basis points above a benchmark rate. We issue, uh, at 53 basis points above a benchmark rate, and we issued it at 50 basis points, which was three basis points tighter, which effectively was, for the five-year bond, was about $300,000 uh, for the period of that bond. But as I said, it's hard to know because we hadn't issued uh, 
you know, uh, the last time we should was two years before that. So it's hard to gauge secondary levels are not an ideal uh, comparison, but we believe that you know it tied much price, uh, much tighter than um, than uh, our secondary levels. Yeah. Okay. No further questions or comments, uh, Councillor Holtz. Thank you, Mr. Chair, it, and it is a comment, so no questions. I just wish to comment in huge support. We've got our our climate change summit organised by the Chief Sustainability Officers wonderful team happening down at Grid AKL as we speak. And if you are aware of the huge challenge that we're facing with climate change, I want to acknowledge Councillor Darby and Councillor Hills for their contributions yesterday. Um, the green bonds, I think, are going to, well, I would hope, are going to be a system that's used increasingly to fund the not just the requirements to deal with climate change, but the huge gulf that we need to leap to actually have an entirely different financial system and an entirely different Auckland Council. And this feels like a, a small start, but a very clear start. So I just want to acknowledge the team for this amazing work. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, just, just on that comment, um, I've come from a business breakfast with, um, as part of that, conference um, where we talked about investment and how we are going to fund um, climate mitigation, so reducing emissions, as well as the resilience component, so knowing that our assets and infrastructure need to be resilient to uh, impacts of climate change. And then I'm about to head to a, a session convened by the Aotearoa Circle, which um, is a group that Council is a member of, and the focus this afternoon is literally the sustainable finance, um, it's a sustainable finance forum talking about how the country, New Zealand, needs to move to more sustainable financing funding mechanisms. So, yes, this is one part of the discussions that we'll have at those, that session. Councillor Bartley. Um, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, thank you for uh, this report and for your work. Um, my question is around, um, uh, you know, uh, you've got point 19 and you've got five signatories already to the pledge. Are those current, are there other signatories or is it just five so far? And then my other question is, um, are there similar schemes or pledges that we should be um, involved with as well? Thank you. Yes, uh, no, there, there are more than five. I think on the last count there was 15 or 16 issuer signatories and a number of supporter signatories as well. Um, the Climate Bonds Initiative um, launched this program around the time that we did our um, first issuance. So they're going through that process of galvanising the support around it. So that was just a snapshot of, I guess, relevant cities. Um, so there's a bunch of financial organisations as well that are signed up to it. Um, in terms of other frameworks, um, yeah, look, um, a lot of stuff around C40 that we do from a city's perspective, there are spur-off um, agreements and so on, not just about finance, um, but also about other initiatives that we need to work on for the city. Um, Finance-wise, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. This Aotearoa Circle um, group that we're joined up to from a New Zealand context, I think, is the most relevant one um, domestically. So. Right. Well, we've got no further questions or anything. So, uh, or comments. So, um, I, there's a motion that's up there. Be moved and seconded. All those in favour? Against? We are quiet today. Anyway, that was passed unanimously, I thought. Okay, right, we will go to item 10 and we will thank you, thank you Alex and Andrew, um, Josie and, and Alistair please, um, Rafa, yeah. and councillors, uh, you'll note there is there is a, a, a letter that's been circulated to you which really supersedes the letter that's on 109, so there is a letter from Vern Walsh and the committee which um, is more fulsome and it's information. Right. Uh, Tēnā koutou Chair, Mr Mayor, members, Taipuri Councillors, thank you. This report uh, seeks approval of the total levy applied for by the Auckland Regional Amenities Funding Board, 15,504,500 for the 2019-2020 year. Uh, the Funding Board believes that the level of funding proposed in this plan is in line with the key funding principles that are outlined within the Act, and that's in accordance with the purpose of the Act, 
which is the provision of a mechanism for adequate, sustainable and secure funding for the nine specified amenities. Um, the proposed levy is within the levy cap provided for by the legislation and staff believe that approving this levy reinforces this council's ongoing commitment and long-term support for the nine amenities and therefore recommend that this committee approve the 2019-2020 funding level request. Happy to take any questions, Chair. So, Councillor, just do reflect on, on our letter to Arafa, which is on page 107, and then the reply, which is um, which you have. Um, we obviously had concerns um, for the not only the levy this year, which is 6.18, but I'm more concerned with the projected uh, increases for the next two years of over 18% and 24%. So we were really um, asking them to go back and get the entities to be more realistic. There's no question about that. Um, and then there is the other question of um, we, we were acknowledging they, they are working in a, in a difficult environment with um, non-public money and sponsorship getting increasingly difficult to, to actually um, source. And um, the other thing we put in the letter, which is in the second second paragraph, is we, we were empathetic. We were noticing the pressures, especially in the arts area, for staff costs. Um, it's, it's a constant pressure and we are aware of that. And uh, the, the response has been, uh, is there in the letter from um, Vern. So are there any questions from anyone? Councillor Casey. Um, I've got two questions um, for either of you, Alice, we can say they. Uh, the first is, in the letter, it talks about a reduction of funds from gambling, from the gambling trusts. Can you talk a little about, about that in respect to the nine amenities? And also, I don't want another question. If you answer that one, I'll remember my next question. That's in Vern Walsh's letter. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I've got to remember the next question. It was um, you said in the letter that um, amenities have to signal their interest in increasing funding in later years. Have you had that signal from all nine? And if not, how many? Uh -huh. yep. Oh, there we go. Sorry. Um, yes, we've had that signal, and I think all nine amenities have signalled um, increases coming in the, the forthcoming years. Um, and as um, the chair said, um, the regional amenities funding board is very aware of that. They think that um, the proposed increases of the amenities is at a level that's not um, sustainable. Um, and I think the support of the council view that they need to be moderated. Um, the other question in relation to the gambling trusts, um, look, I've got no sp specific information on that. At, at the moment, we can come back to you on that anecdotally. I think that there's just a, a reduction in funding um, available partly due to a sinking lid on, on gambling um, facilities, but just in general, um, the environment for the amenities is, is very tough to get um, sponsorship. Um, a lot of sponsorship is now coming in in kind rather than in cash. So that's, I think, the general environment that the amenities are working in. Also, I'd be interested in finding out from, for each of the amenities what has been the reduction in funding from gambling. Yes. Uh, through you, Chair. The um, nine amenities will be presenting to this committee in May and June this year, and we will make them aware of the queries that you have, Councillor Casey, and forward that on. Thank you. Ask one supplementary. Yep. In the signalled increases, what's been the biggest one and by whom? Uh, through you, Chair. The, or, the Auckland Rescue Helicopter Trust, the Auckland Theatre Company, Coast Guard, Drowning Prevention are generally um, signalling minimal increases and the remaining other nine, uh, five out of the nine amenities are signalling much higher increases. And can I just say through you, Chair, that we, I think the, um, the funding board themselves are very well aware of these 
huge increases proposed for 2020 21, a 18% and 21-22, 24%. And they have um, asked each of the nine amenities to prepare the allocations appropriately and signal in further years what their appropriate needs might be. What they have recognised in the past is that when the actual application comes in, that it is considerably less. So I think the amenities probably perhaps needs to think about a five-year plan and what is an appropriate request. And we also note that, you know, council is funder of last resort and that the amenities, I know that it's a very difficult um, environment for sponsorship or any other funding, but they must try and either cut their cloth to suit or perhaps, um, uh, you know, reduce their costs in other ways, in more appropriate ways, and, uh, and make that appropriate through their funding application to the funding board. Thank you, Chair. Meg off. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Mr Chair. Um, the fund level of funding increase across the board is 6.1%, uh, so it's obviously uh, significantly higher than the level of inflation. But you tell us that the increases are consistent with funding principles and there's no reasons to reject them. Um, how much flexibility does Council actually have in not accepting this given it's bound by the legislation? Very little. I, I suspected and feared that would be the answer. I mean, it is a fact of life that certainly in the arts sector, it's just increasing pressure worldwide um, in those amenities and, and services and deliveries. So um, what can we do? Right, um, there's no one else. I'm seeking a seconder. Oh, it has been seconded. We've got a seconder. So I'm going to put, sorry, we're going to talk. Chris? I, I um, raise my hand oh, to second sorry. it yep. and speak sorry. to it. Yep, Councillor Fletcher. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. And in seconding this, um, I'm very mindful of the financial ramifications for Council. And I'm also well aware of the effort you have personally put in to actually trying to see um, uh, some restraint on, but as the Mayor has correctly pointed out, the statutory obligations that we have. Um, the reality is with uh, ARAFA, we have a great board. Um, we are demonstrating Council's ongoing commitment. And especially at a time like this in our history, um, we, we do appreciate the importance of the arts in terms of the well-being of the people and, and the organisations that, other organisations that are represented in the ARAFA funding. But this is an anomaly from amalgamation. Every year we have a discussion around the fact that this is an anomaly and is this the very best way um, of the investment that Council wants to make into all of the organisations that we currently support through the statute? Uh, at what point is it that we can actually provide the advocacy to central government to say maybe we can do this better. Maybe there is a legislative priority that needs to be accorded to this to see how we can actually continue to support the arts and the Coast Guard and the, uh, the Westpac helicopter and all of the other organisations, but can we do it in a more effective way? And I believe we can. In saying that, I want to particularly recognise the two officers who are here. They've worked on this diligently over recent years. They've worked to ensure that we have the very best directors um, that are involved, that the best funding decisions can be taken. But I, I do implore you, Mr Chairman, as a result of this, and I'm sure it will be passed today, um, that we actually apply some advocacy again to central government because this is an anomaly. So uh, thank you again, Mr Chairman, um, for the restraint that you have brought to bear on this, but I, I would really hope that we can actually deal with it more effectively going into the future. Alistair, do you want to comment in the vein of the culture review, which may or may involve and cover some of these entities, obviously not the Helicopter Trust and a few others, but I mean, can you just give us an update because we were going to ask Ed afterwards, but whether Ed can come up. 
um, because he's leading the next two items, but just to um, get an early steer on that. Uh, good morning, councillors. Um, the current plan is to bring you a new terms of reference for phase two of the Cultural Heritage Review, uh, probably to environment and community and, uh, on the 9th of April, but it could be the 2nd of May governing body meeting, not quite sure yet. Um, at this stage, what we're likely to be proposing is to keep it limited to the cultural heritage institutions that were part of phase one. And that's, as I've said before to the committee, um, slightly a pragmatic decision about doability and what um, we need to get done. Um, but I do think that there is the opportunity, perhaps at a later stage, to um, think, start thinking about, in respect of what Councillor Fletcher just said, uh, the ARAFA amenities. Uh, that would be my view at, at this stage. Um, I mean, I'd probably be happy for Alistair or Councillor Holst to maybe comment as well. Okay, just um, may pay to have a little think, rethink of that because in the actual report itself, it did talk about going down to the next tier in some areas so that there's plenty of time between now and April or May to consider uh, whether we do dig a little bit deeper and at which whether it does involve any of these entities, I don't know. Are there any further questions? Uh, Councillor Holtz. And sorry, it's not a question, Mr Chu, just a comment to, to back it up, if that's OK. Yep, yep. Um, we have been talking about this a lot, and I just want to acknowledge the entities that are here and the level of discussion that's that's happened, particularly even over the last week or so, has really taken things to another level as far as the cultural review goes. And what we're looking at with the cultural review, and it will be reflected in the terms of reference that come to environment and community, is that we're looking to make the best of the cultural and arts centre as a whole and as a series of entities. We're not looking at specifically the, the sort of ARAFA side of things. We're, we're sort of starting from a, a slightly different place, saying how do we be the best that we can be given the complexity of us but the depth of our, our, our cultural heritage in, in the Auckland region. So although the ARAFA funding at this stage is relevant, I, I've personally don't think, and that's just why I hopped around to check with Ed, I don't think that the two necessarily collide with each other. So I think the cultural review needs to stand on its own, and then that will, the, the next round of the ARAFA discussion, I think, will will give some, or that will then give some guidance to the next round of the ARAFA discussion. As far as the do we go deeper into some of the next cultural layers, that certainly is a, a discussion that, that we're having. But again, I, I just want to acknowledge the entities here for their, their kind of goodwill and the level of trust that's starting to be built between all of the entities involved. Thank you. Anyone else? No? All right. Well, we can put that. We have a move and we have a second on Councillor Fletcher, so we'll put that. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Aye. And against. Thank you again. Right. We're moving, walking on to Museum of Transport and Technology and Ed again and Alistair, and we welcome Michael and at the back there, Michael uh, Crawley. Um, and, yep. Yep. We have a mover already, so um, we have a seconder. I will second um, second this. So right, it. Welcome. Uh, this morning, Motet is uh, seeking a 13% increase in its levy to 15.812 million. Uh, largely, this, is, this increase is to cover the first year of its proposed 10-year plan of works, which is called Approach 2. Uh, the Approach 2 program is set out in paragraph 18 of the report, um, and it largely is a downscaled version of what it sought in the long-term plan uh, process last year. It covers um, essential works um, needed to ensure weather tightness um, and uh, customer experience at MOTAT. And the total cost of that is 12.5 million, as I say, over 10 years to be financed by a bank loan, which is on terms no worse than what it could get directly from council. 
And uh, essentially, the the ten year one million per year increase in the levy is uh, the security for that loan. Um, Overall, uh, we recommend you approve the levy. It's in accordance with the principles in the Act. Um, and just to add to what we talked about in the cultural heritage review space, uh, long term, and this applies to Auckland Museum, which you'll consider in a few minutes as well, the review will really provide us an opportunity for Council to consider its relationship with these two institutions and the other three that are part of the review. And that really includes Council developing a stronger sense of the strategic priorities that it wants to achieve from its investment in cultural heritage. And as I say, we'll bring that terms of reference to you in April. Michael, we know you're coming uh, back in a month or two, so you don't need to be yet, but please just... Do you want to introduce your colleagues as well? Uh, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Tainui Te Waka, ko Ngāti Amani Opoto, Ko Napui Huki Na Iwi, Ko Michael Flawyer Ho, Ko Tia Kaihatu Maite, Ki Taku Ta Maui, uh, Ko Leslie McTurk, our Deputy Chair, <coughs> and chair. Uh, sorry, Chair, well spotted, <laughs> uh, Kia, um, uh, Ki Taku Ta uh, Mato, Ko Wayne Shack, our General Manager of Business Services. Ane Ta Mato uh, Mote Plan, so it's our great pleasure to uh, present our draft annual plan to the uh, councillors today. Our annual plan, as it's um, drafted, summarises the significant progress that we've made over the last few years. It clearly sets out the amount of the levy and what we intend to do with it and why. Uh, the letter of support from Regional Facilities Auckland uh, refers to our focus on past, present and future Kiwi technology and ingenuity and how uh, that has a high resonance with our audience. Their letter goes on to point out that over the last 18 months to two years, our visitor demographic has changed by age, culture and gender. And our demographic is now closely aligned to that of the cities. Um, our focus on past, present and future Kiwi technology is a deliberate strategy on our part. Uh, one of the things that uh, I suppose Ian Taylor of Animation Research down in Dunedin quotes regularly is we are a nation of innovators, starting with the tangata whenua. And our vision and our strategy is designed to focus on that aspect specifically as well as transport, because in our view, transport is part of our technological um, and ingenuity history. Uh, by focusing on that, we believe that you build the mana of not just uh, the nation, but also the people, and you create um, inspiration, which will then inspire, we would argue, the future uh, generation or the latest generation to go on to be the next innovators, which will then in turn create educational, social, economic and cultural outcomes, which again, not only benefit Auckland, but also benefit New Zealand. I think it's fair to say you only have to think of somebody like Peter Beck um, and Rocket Lab to see what the potential is if the young generation take a lead from him. As outlined in our annual plan, and you've heard from Ed, uh, we are looking to, for an increase in our levy to cover the approach to projects. Those projects are designed to not only improve the visitor experience at MOTAT, but also to support the Western Spring Precinct and our neighbours in that area, as well as the local community. If you take the car park and the Greenway Cycleway as an example, that is quite a critical project in the light of the imminent uh, Central Interceptor Works, which will take out Stadium Road and potentially other car parking in Great North Road. Uh, so we need to provide certainty to those who want to come and enjoy the amenities in the Western Springs precinct. Uh, finally, since it um, came up, uh, I would like to take the opportunity to confirm publicly that we fully support the cultural review. Uh, we have been a proactive uh, participant in the process so far and we are um, keen to continue uh, being a proactive 
participant in it. The review, in our view, provides the city with a fantastic opportunity to look at uh, creating a sus sustainable and inspiring arts, cultural, science and heritage platform, um, which again will have significant social, economic, educational and cultural outcomes. And in my view, the review is probably going to have the biggest impact since the opening of Te Papa in 1998. So there is a major opportunity there. And like I say, we, we fully support um, the initiative that is underway as I speak. On this uh, note, I'd like to just hand over to our chair who would like to say a few words. So no ray ra, tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. Welcome, Lisa. Councillors, um, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you uh, about our, um, our annual plan and our levy request. Um, we're very proud at MOTAT as to what has been achieved over the last five years. We're in the fifth year of a five-year strategy, and we believe you know, we are well positioned to progress uh, what is effectively a part of the Athfield plan, which is a vision that Sir Ian Athfield came up with for the museum. We think it's absolutely critical for the visitor experience, which is the first um, objective we have. But I think the, the last of four objectives we have is also business continuity. And if MOTAD is to continue to thrive and grow and, and develop based on our strategy, we actually do need to continue this investment. And this is a, a mere shadow, if you like, of the financial commitment that would have been involved in the full Athfield plan, but we believe uh, in light of Council's uh, you know, decision to not make a decision on that funding um, prior to the cultural review, that we would seek their support for this approach to funding. And I, if I could just add, um, the cultural review that uh, the Council, the independent review that they have embarked upon, is something that MOTAD is 100% committed to. We see that there are huge opportunities as a result of looking at the range of cultural and heritage institutions and what could be done better and differently, and the Council has MOTAT's 100% support in progressing its thinking about that. So thank you. All right. Well, I think it's a great approach to take the focus on the New Zealand, because every time I get in a jet boat, I reflect on Bill Hamilton and say, wow, and it could be a jet boat anywhere in the world, and you say that was invented in New Zealand. It's a, it's a great thing. Councillor Casey and then Councillor Bartley. I've got three questions, Michael, in no particular order. I'll start with the usual one, which is how much of your revenue is taken at the gate at the moment in terms of your prices? And I'm looking at your prices on our page 174. <laughs> Sorry. About 15% of our... Um, five zero or one five? Fifteen percent of our five. total revenue is through the gate or um, other um, revenue-generating activities on site. So just on the gate price, if you have a fam if you don't buy that yearly ticket and you've got a family of two children, it's 50 bucks to get in. Really, that. It's quite prohibitive. Have you had any, or your board, had any ideas about decreasing the prices to get more people through the gate to come back and give you more revenue? Uh, um, actually, what we've found with our demographic is uh, if you're a keen uh, visitor to MOTAT, you buy the MOTAT annual pass, which enables you to come back not just with two adults but four um, um, children. Uh, one of the initiatives that we are looking at with the Auckland Zoo is a joint ticket uh, whereby families can come and do both institutions either the same weekend or do one and come back at another time. Uh, we do have a number of other initiatives which are designed to um, bring in families. For example, we have a number of uh, activities on for Pacifica. That's free entry this weekend. I actually have to put a plug in for that one. So um, if you're at Pacifica, and I know uh, the Mayor Phil Goff will be, please stop in and have a look at what's going on at uh, MOTAT. But we do look at that initiative. So we do look at the pricing to make sure that um, we're not um, being that prohibitive. I think I should also add that uh, with the help of Perpetual Guardian, with our latest exhibition, Above and Beyond, 
uh, we were bringing in low decile schools. So the transport covered, uh, perpetual go again covered the cost of that and uh, we were bringing the schools in for free entry so we weren't charging them to come in for that particular exhibition. So can I just ask, um, in previous years, probably before, way before your time, Michael, there, there were free days yep. at Motat which were very heavily subscribed. Is there any intention to offer? It's just to get people through the door because once they're through the door, they'll come back. And I, th I do think the, co the family cost of the, the family class is $95. Uh, for an got, annual pass, yes. Yep. And yep. if you've got two kids um, coming in for a day is... is um, it'll be 50 bucks. Yeah, so, so if you... If you yeah, so we find that with those with the Motet um, family annual pass, they come in uh, four or five, if not six times a year, and so if you put that into it, it's quite good value. You're right, before on my arrival, we did um, rate uh, pay a free entry. What happened there is that the it was done by um, uh, local board region, uh, by local board, and so what would happen is people would wait until their local board came up, then come in for the free entry and then wait for it to come up again. So it actually um, didn't have a material impact on the number of visitors. It just meant that you get this sort of uh, effect. What we did do um, just before my arrival is we, um, we didn't charge for free entry in the month of July. I think it was July 2012, or it might have been 2013. You're absolutely right. We had something like 70,000 visitors through the museum in one month, uh, but our infrastructure literally couldn't cope with that number. So uh, what I can say is our board um, are very conscious of pricing. We're watching that all the time, and, we are very, and we're looking at various initiatives to get more and more people through. So I hope that helps. There's a bit of yeah. um, oh, I have to raise it. It's, it's, uh, I've got two small questions which you can answer quite quickly. I was intrigued by your anti-Valentine's Day event. Was it held? Was it successful? What was it, actually? And the second one was the tram. How successful is the tram? And it, how, how much revenue does that generate? OK, so um, I will get Wayne to look up the tram numbers while I answer the first question. So. The anti-Valentine's Day um, involved people, um, uh, not necessarily as couples, uh, coming in because they didn't want um, the usual heart cards and stuff like that, and it included activities where you could beat up what was, um, um, well, titled your father's car, God knows why, but you get um, baseball bats and things and you could go to town on a, on a car, um, it had um, uh, live music. Uh, you could put your um, ex into uh, one of those um, water baths where you got to throw a ball at it, and yeah, and then uh, put them into no, not eggs. It's my ex boyfriend girlfriend, not eggs. No, eggs a bit of a bit of a, an unusual topic at the moment. So um, uh, you may not want to. So. Um, and I highly encourage actually the councillors to go to those events because they are they are quite um, <laughs> unusual. So the, we got close to two thousand people in for for that event. It's the first year we're we're doing it, and uh, because of the success of that, we will do that sort of thing um, again next year. We have another one called WTF, which I won't go into what that stands for, uh, where you can actually race toilets, um, which are designed by uh, New Zealanders and throw axes and do all sorts of unusual things like that. <laughs> Dealing with the trams, um, our tram uh, numbers, Jermaine? So we uh, have an excess of 200,000 um, passengers on the tram a year. Um, the price of, of getting on the tram is included in the ticket, but people can um, also, if they haven't come into the museum, use the tram and they pay a dollar, and we get between sixty and hundred thousand dollars of additional revenue outside the uh, included in ticket prices. So just um, as by way of, of sort of filling in the backstory on that, what we also do, and um, which is not common knowledge, is that the tram is used by the Western Springs College students when it rains. We take the, we stop, pick them up and take them to the bus stop. Um, but we also uh, stop off and drop and pick up uh, people who are at the zoo, which is why when you start thinking of our visitor demographic and um, the connection between the zoo, which is uh, technology, science, environmentally based, and that's where we're 
aiming to uh, focus as well. There's a natural synergy there, and we have a natural, uh, well, not a natural, it's a man-made, man-made link between our two sites and the zoo. So the, the tram gets um, a lot of usage. One of the issues that we have coming up in relation to the tram is that it was never designed to take the volume of traffic that it does take. So we're in the process of going through the whole tram infrastructure to make sure that it's uh, resilient um, and capable of continuing on. And where it's not, we're upgrading, uh, or potentially not, we're, we're upgrading the system. OK. Member Hanari, I believe your ex was spotted there. <laughs> <laughs> Not being egged, was being dumped in the water. <laughs> right, Councillor Bartley. Thank you, Mr Chair, and through you, thank you for your report and your presentation. Uh, I just want to know if I've got this right, so um, apologies if I, if I haven't, but um, I notice like your the levy that you're asking for is quite a high percent increase, and I, I look at the museum, and the museum have asked for 2.5, and you guys have asked for 13%. And I'm just mindful of the fact that, you know, we've got a lot of demands on ratepayer money and things like that. And then I also see that you've got a 12.5 million loan, which I think we're going to end up being responsible for somehow. Um, and also, um, you talked about the culture of review. So you're still going ahead with your bank loan and your plans. You're not waiting for the review to finish in case that might help. So I'm just wondering what's going on. Thank you. Okay, so um, dealing with the increase in levy, actually the amount that we're asking for our operational costs is um, similar to the uh, Auckland Museum. It, it comes out at 12% when you add in the million dollars extra that we're um, asking for to cover the approach to projects. Uh, if we don't do this and we wait the outcome of the review, which could take years, um, especially if it requires a change in the legislation, the museum will effectively stall. And at the moment, we are on a very good projection. Our visitor numbers are up, our revenue is up, um, we've got um, the projects that I've identified give our visitors certainty as to where to park. And you only have to um, think of the consequences of the central interceptor work on MOTAT. Um, we will lose parking in Stadium Road. Uh, there will be knock-on impacts to the Great North Road. So if we, don't, if we are unable to provide our visitors with somewhere to park, they will stop coming. So it's a catch-22. Yes, we could wait for the outcome of the review, but um, how long is that going to take? And while we're waiting for the outcome of the review, we effectively end up in a stalled position. So we will not be able to continue the progress that we've been um, making. So I hope that, I hope that um, sort of gives you a feel for where we're coming for in, in relation to uh, this um, increase. <coughs> All right, thank you. Um, Ed or Alistair, any, any further to add? Oh, I think from a staff point of view, I think it's appropriate for MOTAT to be um, requesting the money for these kind of works to keep the museum um, going while we do undertake the review. I think that could be two or three years before we see any significant results from that. And councillors, you do have to be reflective of the LTP where we, we did reject um, what was a very substantial proposal from MOTAT. So. All right, I'm glad we have a mover and a second, but I want to um, thank Michael and Lisa and, and Wayne uh, for the presentation. So I've got a mover and a second. All those in favour, say aye. aye. Against? Good. Thank you. Right, we are going to take the um, we are going to take the, the museum, War Memorial Museum item next, um, and then it will be a break, and then Eden Park um, come forward. Welcome, welcome Joe, welcome David. Tignasha, I think, yes, there we are, Tignasha, here we are. So, uh, but, uh, sorry, Ed will introduce, and David, if you could then introduce the roles of the two, your two adopters. Um, so, this year, uh, for 2019-2020, Auckland Museum is seeking a levy of 32.292 million. 
This is an increase of 2.5% from the current financial year, or 788,000. Um, I'll assume you've read the report and just make some other uh, remarks. Um, compared to last year's annual plan, the museum has worked quite hard to out, um, align its outcomes with the Auckland Plan 2050. Um, I think you have a handout as well from the museum. Is that right? Yep. Yes. Everyone has a um, and that's a testament to the value that the museum is delivering for the city. And in particular, um, of note, the museum's highest visitation ever across the three categories of on-site, online and off-site. <laughs> Uh, off-site in particular is rising, and that's a testament to the education, public programs and other partnerships that the museum's developed. Um, councillors will also be aware that the domain works are progressing really well, and that'll um, provide, um, for the first time, a proper footpath from the Parnell side to the atrium, uh, both a, um, which will also have uh, wheelchair access. I went and had a look at it the other day, and it's um, looking really good. Uh, so we recommend the levy be approved as the annual plan and the levy request is in accordance with the legislation. Um, and yes, I'll pass over to David and um, his board members. Okay, Marina Tato, um, called David Gamesaho, and I'm accompanied this morning by the chair of the planning committee of Auckland uh, War Memorial Museum Trust Board, Joe Brosnahan and by Jignasha Patel, who is our Director of Enterprise and Finance. Good morning. Um, thank you very much for inviting us to present very briefly to you today. Um, I've uh, issued you with a, a short summary of uh, data and um, outcomes from the previous year. I hope you'll find that interesting and perhaps a little bit more interesting than, than the traditionally very dry report that comes to you from Council. Uh, colleagues, um, but uh, uh, we're not just a cost centre. I think the, um, what we're showing you is that we produce some very, very strong benefit and value for Auckland through your support of Auckland Museum, for, to which we, for which we are immensely grateful. Um, the performance this year is, is strong. Um, you'll see in terms of highlights are increasing visitation, uh, we set out in our five-year plan to you last year that we're on track for uh, reaching 1.2 million by 2022-23. We're on track with um, over 900,000, the first time the institution has broken that 900,000 barrier. And so we've got a very, very strong uh, trajectory there. Um, our self-generated income is growing at 5% year on year, and that will change out over time um, the reliance, the long-term reliance on the levy. And our levy rate is projected to go this year 2.5, but by 2022-23 down to 2. And then beyond that, we see a further reduction. And that is all on the back of growing income around visitation and our other commercial activity. Um, you'll see also in the highlights, and we've provided Council um, with a copy of the latest cost-benefit analysis, both economic and social benefit, that Auckland Museum creates for Auckland every... $100 invested in Auckland Museum creates a return of $162 for Aucklanders. Um, those are strong performance uh, measures uh, by any standard um, in the global metropolitan museum sector. Um, we're delighted to present our annual plan to you this year. The focus is on metamorphosis. It is on transformation, uh, a major program of uh, capital investment. Uh, which will create uh, a whole series of new and refreshed public gallery spaces, improved connectivity, wayfinding, new galleries, and a new special exhibition hall, which will bring international museum content to Auckland, really on, an, on, a, on a consistent basis for the first time. And we will um, present um, the results of that transformation to you in a big reveal in the middle of 2020 and we're currently negotiating a major loan of a, a very spectacular exhibition from one of Europe's leading national museums to launch our new special exhibition hall. Auckland will become a place uh, where the world, where Auckland will, will, will see the world uh, in its broadest cultural sense uh, at Auckland Museum. Um, You've heard from colleagues that we're completing some major investment on the domain. Um, we are just completing the, the construction of the Southern Pathway, which will link uh, the museum to Parnell Road. Um, this is the first safe pedestrian link to the museum 
since the museum was um, opened in 1929. And we thank um, Auckland Transport for the support and contribution that it has made to that major initiative and to the support and encouragement of colleagues on the Domain Committee. Um, and as Michael and colleagues at, at MOTAT have, have said this morning, we are very much looking forward to engaging in the next stage of the Council's review of its investment in its arts and culture. Um, we believe, and we've said so last year, and continue to say that we believe there are huge opportunities for um, greater efficiency through collaboration and joint investments uh, to be agreed between the institutions concerned. Uh, when I came to Auckland um, just under two years ago, I saw um, a pretty fragmented arts and culture sector. I think if there's one thing that we need to achieve that can come out of this review, it will be a new initiative around collaboration, joint investment and partnership. Look seriously at some shared services. We can contribute to that efficiency uh, model that we heard about at the beginning of your session this morning. Uh, we have a contribution to make as well. And I think through um, the work that we'll be, we'll be doing together over the next six to 12 months, we shall be finding some very, very strong uh, opportunities for greater collaboration and efficiency saving. So we look forward to that um, process. And just finally, just to say that I think we've um, been working very hard over the last few months, uh, if not over a year now, to um, begin to platform that work through the initiative of the Museums of Auckland Consortium. Uh, this has already established a new joint landing page for visitors to Auckland to begin to plan their cultural journey and to develop their own story of Auckland through visitation and experiences that the sector can offer. Um, it has created um, a pilot for a new multi-site ticket for our international independent travelers. Uh, and we're just about to launch um, a new um, uh, cross-search um, digital um, uh, facility to enable people to um, um, create a journey across Auckland's cultural assets online. So, that's all happening with very little resource. Um, we, um, our proposition to you is that over the next 12 months, we'll be able to find even stronger uh, potential benefits and outcomes through the process of the review. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say this morning. Um, happy to take any questions. Okay. Joe or Ignacio, you want to say anything? No? Uh, kia ora no, I just want to um, support David and the CFO here in terms of the work that's gone on at the museum um, to deliver this. Um, I would just comment perhaps that um, in this day, uh, in these days that we're having right now, there's no more important place than that museum on the hill in terms of a place to both uh, remember, commemorate and to gather together the, the diversity of who we are as Aucklanders. So I, I think I, I feel fortunate that I've joined at a time at which after nearly a decade of planning, we're actually in a whole transformation phase to deliver, I think, something quite special um, over the next year or two um, uh, to build on, on our current offering, which is all about um, uh, uh, being that place and space, I think, that we as Aucklanders um, can, can be together. So um, the board and the director and executive work really hard to uh, align ourselves with what we're aware that the council wants and needs in terms of its um, own strategy and so on. And I think that's been mentioned. And I think you'll see that reflected through our, through our document. We've tried really hard to keep within the envelope that we felt was affordable from the council's point of view. So um, that's what we've delivered. Thank you. Thank you for those appropriate words, Joe. Um, and just on the latter, which is the finances, it is noticeable that you know the 12.9% increase in external other revenue is, is noted. Um, if, if you could, there's a lot of other organisations in Auckland who perhaps could get your advice that we would uh, appreciate. Right. Any questions? May I um, uh, move by Councillor Walker? I'll get a seconder. Councillor Simpson will second. Councillor Casey, your question. Um, two questions. 
Could you tell me a little bit about your main source of commercial revenue and how you're going to grow that? And my second one was the last time we met, we talked about um, a bus going to the museum. That would now have been trialled and established. I'd like to know how that's going. And also the parking issues in the domain, yeah. the days where you can't get your punters into the museum because the commuters have taken out the places. Thank you, Councillor. If I just deal with the um, transport and parking matters first, and then I'll hand over to my colleague, Jignesha, to answer on the commercial revenue pattern uh, model. Um, firstly, on um, transport, yes, we do have the first public route to the Auckland Museum in operation now. It's the 781. Um, I come on it every morning. <laughs> uh, it goes through Remerera, so it's very convenient for me. I didn't, I didn't actually plan that, but uh, I'm, I'm using it. Um, I sit with all the school children dropping off in Newmarket. But it's operating um, every half hour, and um, it's growing in popularity. It goes through Newmarket, picks up a lot of visitors um, at Newmarket Station. Um, so we're pleased that that is um, in, in operation now, and I think uh, it'll be interesting to see what the evaluation data looks like after the full first year of operation. Um, in terms of parking, um, yes, we're working very closely with the Domain Committee to address um, the issue of long-stay commuters on the Domain who are compromising access for visitors to the museum and to those who want to use the amenity of the Domain. Um, most parking, we know from AT's own study, has been taken up by long-stay commuters. So we're undertaking and planning with the Domain Committee a series of initiatives to address the issue. Uh, one um, uh, initiative that we have um, ready to go um, from the middle of this year is to create a barrier arm uh, around the Totoki Street uh, roads, uh, which will align the um, access to those roads will align with museum opening hours. So basically disincentivizing long stay commuters who are taking up vital parking for those who want to use the amenity. Um, so that, I think, is um, um, a, a rational and reasonable step forward, which will release, we hope, a large proportion of that parking back to amenity users. So that's a pilot, and I think the Domain Committee will want to review that work and uh, come back to you at some stage with um, how that has progressed. Um, I hope that's sufficient, and I'll hand over to my colleague. In terms of the commercial revenue side of things, there are three... Um, avenues through which we, we we really focus on revenues. The first one is really around tourism, the admissions revenue. As you know, Auckland Museum is free for all Auckland ratepayers, and so that's a it's a deliberate strategy because this is our museum. All of us have a vested interest in it, and we see that uh, expanding through a lot of our programs we do around reaching as many Aucklanders going into the south, the west, the north, and it's really around that. Um, but from a commercial perspective, tourism is a key part of it. So we do have um, what we think is a, is a reasonable charge for tourism, and we have different packaging along with cultural performance um, packages as well that, it, that really targets the tourism market. This next stage um, of commercial revenue is really around leveraging us as a facility. And so in terms of venues, hospitality offerings, and how we integrate with the communities around us. So that um, provides a certain level of, um, quite a high level of revenue as well. Retail is a, uh, continuing to play an important part. The museum, I'm delighted to say the museum store is one of the most profitable um, and successful museum store ventures that I've seen, uh, certainly in our space in Australasia. So it's, um, it actually works because it provides a beautiful link between our museum curated items um, as well as the store. So bringing the Auckland story to life along with the New Zealand story. And our focus is very much on New Zealand as an offering. And the final piece is really around um, public programs and exhibitions. David has mentioned our desire around getting more and more international offerings. And we see that as being um, a significant driver of increased revenue in the future as well. And, and the public as Aucklanders, we would be prepared to pay for world-class international exhibitions because that's really about an added value that happens. So those are the, the main um, commercial revenue streams and certainly will be, um, we've got strategies in place to grow that to the 12 million in, um, by 2022. Thank you. Chairman, um, 
Any sponsorship? Yes. Naming rights or anything like that? Oh. Absolutely. Sponsorship um, revenue is quite significant. Uh, we treat that, um, we earmark them in two spaces, primarily around capital works, uh, around the investment we need to make. And then we do have some operational funding, but that's um, um, probably of a, of a lesser level. Um, so when we do gallery renewals and that sort of thing, that's where we target. We have a dedicated team that looks at corporate sponsorship um, and development. Okay, right, well I have two, uh, two Councillor Bartley and Councillor Lee. Thank you, Mr Chair. I have a comment though. Do you want mm -hmm. me to wait? Uh, no, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr Chair, through you. Thank you for your presentation, for your report. I want to acknowledge the efforts of the museum in terms of reflecting Auckland, and I make um, particular mention of the Pacifica collection. I really, um, really want to acknowledge that. I appreciate um, your efforts in keeping within our um, envelope and the spirit of collaboration that I see coming through. Personally, I value your comments, Jo, um, regarding what we are going through at this time and also the place of the museum being a place for us to gather as Aucklanders and, in, and as Aucklanders in our diversity. So thank you. Okay, Councillor Lee. Yes, I just wish to make a brief comment um, in support of Dr. Gangster. Um, first of all, in regard to uh, visitation at the museum and the, and the domain, which uh, we share. And, and there is a, a challenge with uh, unauthorised parking in the domain area um, by commuters who are not visitors really to the domain nor the museum. And that is a, a difficult problem. And over the last year, we have been working closely with the museum and with other stakeholders to resolve this. And Dr. Gamester has mentioned the barrier arm experiment, which we will undertake. Um, which will protect parking for museum visitors. The second issue that really concerns me and should concern us all is the lack of cooperation from Auckland Transport in regard to public transport access to the museum. There is a bus service from Mission Bay, um, which happily um, is convenient um, for some people, including Dr. Gamester. However, it would be much more, it would be in addition to that, it would be helpful if we could get Auckland Transport to divert the link bus um, down Monsell Street much more closely, much more closer to the museum. Uh, it would also be helpful, especially on weekends and non peak times. It would be also helpful if Auckland Transport could improve signage, wayfinding, and even uh, connections from the Parnell train station, which um, is being developed, but only very slowly. And the final point, um, Mr. Chairman and members, is that I um, question the constant pressure on the museum to make more and more money. Uh, there is a stage where quantity of visitation impacts on the quality of experience. I think it's appropriate for members to look to scrutinise costs, but to be constantly pressuring the museum to make more money, make more money, I think is inappropriate given the importance of that cult cultural institution. Uh, in many ways, it's like a secular temple. It is. A, a war memorial, but some of the nation's finest cultures, cultural treasures are kept there. And I think we need to show a certain amount of respect and not overly encourage a situation where the museum becomes overly commercialised. So I think we should think carefully about that. So thank you for the excellent work you've done over the past year. David, do you wish to respond to that? Thank you for those comments, Councillor. Um, firstly, on the matter of um, transport and wayfinding, um, we've been working very hard with AT recently um, on this matter. Um, I'm quite pleased that we've made quite a lot of progress. Um, when you receive your invitation, councillors, to come to the opening of the Southern Pathway, 
uh, on the domain, which we hope will take place sometime in May, date to be confirmed. Uh, I, we hope you'll be able to see the new wayfinding signage that is going to be put in place to link passengers coming from the link bus on Parnell Road to the new pedestrian crossing on the corner of Monsell Road. Um, that's what I'm trying to put in place at the moment. So that's all going to make sure that there's a complete safe pedestrian link from that particular um, uh, transport junction. Um, that's for me the most important priority. Um, it would be lovely in an ideal world for buses to divert around those streets up towards the museum. But in the meantime, I'm going to be very pleased if we get that wayfinding in place. And I, I'm, I'm very pleased that um, colleagues at AT have been working very closely with us to achieve that. I'm um, glad. And I think that um, the next step will be to use that some momentum to um, improve wayfinding and access from Parnell Station. So let's work together with the Domain Committee to achieve those goals. Um, commercialization. When we're talking about commercialization for the Auckland Museum, I think we need to separate um, the, the, the sense of commercialization and making money with actually trying to establish a new kind of resilience model for the institution. Um, and that is about um, moving the institution on from being a straight public service delivery a user grant and spend it to a new model, which is about social enterprise. It's about um, ensuring that we have a strong and appropriate commercial model through which we can then reinvest in new services and better experiences for our visitors and for Aucklanders. Uh, and that's where we want to go and that's where the sector is going. And this is not just about making money, it's actually creating new resilience uh, and actually being able to create new resources to create better experiences. So that's where we're focused. Uh, we have no issue about that matter. Uh, we're, we've got new capability in the organization. We're bringing people from other sectors with great knowledge and skills and experience and how to achieve this. And uh, my proposition to you is that we will become an inf a much more resilient and sustainable organization over the next decade. Uh, and our five-year plan clearly shows uh, the financial projections through which we'll achieve this over the next five years and then beyond. And I look forward to discussing this particular theme uh, with you in greater detail in due course. Thank you. And I do endorse what uh, Councillor Lee says about over-commercialisation, but I also note with pleasure that you're thinking by 2022 the 2% uh, increase, and was it 2025 naught, was it? <laughs> Beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Hills. <laughs> Councillor Hills. <laughs> oh, Councillor Hills. Uh, Councillor Lee, could you just uh, turn your microphone on? Thanks. Hi. There we go. Um, yeah, just a quick uh, comment to obviously thank you all for the, the work that's um, been done at the museum, and it's a fantastic place. With entry, and I actually experienced good, um, the good side of it, and, and most times I've visited I have, um, you know, it's been very easy to get through and prove I'm an Aucklander and that kind of thing, but I have had a few comments where it's been, been made quite difficult, and I guess my comment, and I know you've said it before, you err on the side of just letting people in, but just, you know, if, if especially if um, English is a second language or um, you can't find clear documentation, or I usually just find something with my address on it on my phone and they're fine, but just um, making sure that there's no limitations. A couple of people have mentioned that they've felt like the bar was too high, so they just left and, and felt not welcome. So I know that's not your intention, and I know generally the staff are really good and pretty relaxed about um, letting anyone um, through without payment. But just, I guess, from me, just continue that, that training to make sure everyone's not overly um, <coughs> restrictive um, and welcoming. But yeah. Right, thank you, Nasha, David, Joe. Um, I'm going to move the resolution. We have a mover and a second. All those in favour? Against? All right, thank you very much. And we're going to take a break till 12 o'clock and then it is straight into Eden Power. Yeah.